Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for being here um, to our uh, Rural Roads webinar here today. As I mentioned, the session is being recorded being recorded so everybody can um, tune in if they're not able to make it today. Um, your microphones have been muted for um, the session here today, but we invite you to use the chat box. Maybe put in the chat box today, tell us where you're from, where in the world you are tuning in from, um, and maybe what the weather is like today. In Victoria, BC, um, which is where I am right now, we uh, love to talk about the weather. So please <laughs> let us know <laughs> what the weather is today. We have uh, some overcast skies here right now, but um, as we say in Victoria, if you don't like the weather, um, just wait again five minutes and uh, we'll have a different one. So <laughs> let me know where you're uh, tuning in from. Of course, um, before any meeting or presentation at Royal Roads, we like to gratefully acknowledge the land that the campus rests upon. Um, so it's with deep gratitude that Royal Roads um, rests upon the traditional lands of the Wasepsum and Lekwungen ancestors and families. We are very grateful to be here um, where the future of Indigenous and non-Indigenous students, uh, faculty and staff come together. So welcome everybody and thank you so much. With that being said, we will flip it over to um, our topic of the day, which is the MA in Higher Education Administration and Leadership Alumni Panel. We have some wonderful guests for you today who we will get to in just a second. But of course, I have the gracious pleasure of co-hosting with Dr. Robin Mueller, who is the program head. Uh, Robin, would you like to say a few words as an introduction? Oh, sure. Thank you, Ariana. So as, as Ariana mentioned, my name is Robin. I am the current program head for the Masters of Higher Education Administration and Leadership. I would like to acknowledge that I, I work on the Royal Roads campus sometimes, but today I am calling in from the traditional territory of the um, Island Halkomenum speaking people near the Sunaymuk First Nation, which is colonially known as the city of Nanaimo. Uh, I have tremendous amount of gratitude for being able to live and work on this um, in this place and space as an uninvited guest. Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us today. And I, I think we can get started with a bit of an agenda. So this is a fairly simple and straightforward session. Our aim is to give you an opportunity to listen to um, some of the stories of experience from our program alumni. So we will do a quick welcome. We'll introduce the alumni panel. We are going to have a discussion around some questions that we've discussed in advance. And then I will turn things back over to Ariana to share a little bit about the application process and to give you the opportunity to ask questions as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, Robin. I appreciate you being here. Um, with that, we will just do a little bit of a panel introduction uh, so everybody can get acquainted here. So first off, we'll just do a little bit of a roundtable. Uh, Jasdeep Rantawa, thank you so much for being here. If you'd like to say a few words about yourself. Sure, thank you. My name is Jasdeep Rantawa and I use she, her pronouns and I am joining you as a queer woman of color, as a daughter of two Indian immigrants. I um, currently am on the Lekwungen territories, the unceded traditional Lekwungen territories, where the Esquimalt, Wasanic, and Saanich people, um, Songhees people, have relationships with the land today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be part of this panel. Thank you, Jazdeep. It's, it's our pleasure to have you, so thank you. Greg Jeffert, hello. Thank you so much for being here. Well, great, great to be here. Uh, my name is Greg Jefford, and uh, I work uh, currently at Fleming College uh, in Peterborough, Ontario, and uh, on the Michi Sagi uh, People's Territory. And uh, yeah, ha I'm happy to be here. I'm a, a recent uh, graduate from the Mahil program uh, with the convocation uh, being last November and finishing with our final residency uh, last June, and look forward to sharing more about my experience with the program. Excellent. Thank you so much, Greg. We are looking forward to hearing your experience as well. Maria Morrison, hello. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I greeted you in my traditional way of Anishinaabe Muen Ojibwe. 
and I said, my name is Many Colors of the Sun Woman. I'm Sturgeon Clan, and I come from Big Grassy River First Nation in Treaty 3 territory, which is in the Northwest Ontario. Um, I live now in Winnipeg, homeland of the Métis, Red River Métis, and Treaty 1 territory. Um, I work as the director in the Office of the Vice President Indigenous at the University of Manitoba currently, and I finished recently the Mahil program with Greg, um, and we graduated, uh, well, finished in June and convocated in November, and so it was my first time to the campus and um, in, in June, I guess it would be my first time for the residency, so it um, was amazing. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, we certainly do have a beautiful campus, so I'm glad you were able to experience it. Um, Tori, last but not least, thank you so much for being here with us. My pleasure, Ariana, and, and good afternoon to you all. Uh, I'm Tori McMillan. Uh, my background is um, part uh, European through my mother, as well as part Ojibwe through my father. So I also um, claim an identity that's mixed and I honor both sides of, of my ancestors. My community is Barron's River First Nation. It's located in Treaty 5, north of the city of Winnipeg. And today I'm joining you from uh, Treaty 7 territory of Southern Alberta. And I work at Mount Royal University. I support a program for indigenous transitional learners. And um, I'm thrilled to be here coming to you from Mokinstasis, which is the Blackfoot word for elbow. And we use that gesture to signify that this is now known as the city of Calgary. I graduated in uh, 2021 with Jazz Deep. And so I'm um, thrilled to be with you all today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tori. We appreciate you being here. And with that, I will pass it back over to you, Robin, and we will get into some um, wonderful discussion. Thank you. So the first question I have for our panelists to respond to today is what, <clears throat> excuse me, what are some of the reasons why you chose the Mikhail program or why you felt it was a good fit for you? I am going to, um, pick folks randomly here to respond to this question and I will start with Jazdeep. Thanks Robin. Yeah, so um, my reason for joining the Mihil program was less um, of a professional reason. It was more of a personal journey for me. Uh, I was looking for the next learning and growth opportunity that would help me kind of figure out my life trajectory, some of the decisions that I wanted to make. Um, and that's exactly what it helped me do. Um, my final paper was on anti-racism in higher education. And if someone had asked me if I wanted to do that topic at the beginning of the program, I would have said, hell no, I'm not touching that topic with a 10 foot pole. Um, but, you know, throughout the program, I gained a lot of confidence and overcame uh, a lot of my imposter syndrome, um, which is, you know, a natural thing to experience when you're part of a master's program like this one, um, overcame it and kind of just told myself, I'm so passionate about this topic that if I don't do it and overcome my fears, then I'll regret it later. So Overall, I didn't come into the program with any goals or ideas, and that opened up as many doors as possible for me. I could pick whatever topic I wanted without feeling any pressure to have every assignment related to my final lit review. Um, so I took as much out of the program, and I've really benefited, mostly personally, um, but professionally as well. Uh, the jobs did come later, so that was really good. Thanks. Thank you. I will turn now to Tori. Perfect. Thank you, Robin. Uh, for me, there were a couple of key moments um, in my journey, and one of them was taking a leadership course here at the, at the university. That really sparked my interest in leadership and how I can uh, continue to develop and, and appreciate uh, what those skills look like. And then uh, for me, one of our, we were at an event here at the university one night and 
uh, beside me at the table was uh, my good friend Sarah Rood. And Sarah took this program. She was one of, in one of the first cohorts. And she, she just kind of turned and said, you know, have you thought about school? And, you know, you should check out Royal Roads because I think you'd love them and, and I think they would love you. And that was all I needed. I looked into it and um, I'm very grateful. You know, I got that support throughout the program from someone who'd walked that journey. And that's why I'm very passionate about being able to support others who are uh, considering this uh, life-changing experience. So for me, the, the decision to go to school was both the challenge, like, like Jazz Deep was talking about, and, but it was also, I came from an elementary teacher background, and now I'm in a university, but I, I can't teach with a bachelor degree. And they said, Tori, if you, if you get your master's, we'll, we'll offer you some teaching. So that was my incentive, so that I could be back in the classroom with the students again. And I, and I have been able to do that. So um, those were the reasons why I felt like Mahil spoke to me and why I needed to go to the coast to uh, continue my learning. Wonderful, thank you, Tori. Uh, next on my screen is Maria. Okay, um, so I had been in educational publishing for 20 some years and I had always toyed around with furthering my education after my bachelor's back in my 20s. And, um, but I was told by some well-meaning PhD person, um, oh, you have so much experience now, you don't need to go for your master's. And um, so I kind of let that sit for a while, for a couple of years, and then the pandemic hit. And I had always thought I wanted to go back for more, um, schooling, but I had, and I had been looking around in the last year or two um, previous to that at, at programs, and I thought as I was a director of a student center at a college, um, that I'd finally kind of found my focus of like higher education, because when you're looking at master's level programs, a lot of times you have to be a little more honed in and specific on what it is you want to learn more about um, in a lot more detail and I don't think I ever really had a, a pure focus before of what that area of expertise that I wanted to continue at and um, so the pandemic kind of opened up opportunities for me because I it was early April so I was a late applier <laughs> to the program I got in very the at the last but uh it was a Saturday in the first two months of, of the pandemic, and um, I closed down Zelda, and it said, you've been playing for 82 hours. <laughs> and I was like horrified, um, and I still hadn't beaten the boss. So I, I was like, wow, I think I can do something way better with my time than playing video games. Um, I like this is I we have no idea how long this is going to be. So I signed up the next day, got all my paperwork in and and, uh, and stuck it out. What a terrific story. Thanks, Maria. And Greg. Oh, you're you're muted there, Greg. Oh, there we go. There we go. Uh, so three main reasons uh, for me. One was I, I've always wanted to do my my master's and in working in post-secondary, uh, the Mahil program uh, was one uh, that was a good, good fit for the work that I do and the work that I want to continue to do for the rest of my career. Uh, second uh, was specifically uh, Mahil at Royal Roads. I had researched uh, a number of different schools uh, for a, a master's in either student affairs or higher education leadership. And I felt like the Mahil program um, from my research, as well as talking to uh, colleagues and friends who had gone to Royal Roads, uh, either in the Mahil program and or uh, for a different program, uh, just spoke so highly of, of Royal Roads and from the Mayhill program, um, the commitment in the program from the faculty and the curriculum. 
Uh, and then third, from a personal standpoint, I'm a dad of two young kids and in appreciating, uh, you know, the importance of uh, continuing to learn and to grow as a person, wanted to just, you know, model that for, uh, for my kids. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. It's so interesting to hear your reasons for, for uh, your interest in the Mahil program. So our next question is, what were the biggest highlights of your experience with the Mahil program? I will, let's start with Maria this time. Okay, biggest highlights. Um, you know, I'm glad the rest of my class is in here because <laughs> they, pro they probably would be like, what? But honestly, finishing my final research paper um, and knowing that I did it and, um, and that two years before that, I honestly didn't think it was possible. Like, I didn't even have a topic. I knew I had an interest. Um, you know, I've, I've done a lot of um, Indigenous education, um, editing and writing, and um, I've been around cultural teachings and pedagogy and uh, ways of teaching and learning. Um, so what was I going to add to any of that? What was I going to look into? What kind of lit review? What could I, what it would be of interest? What, well, what could I even add? Um, but in the end, I just let it happen. And by nine months before I had to have it handed in, it finally all came together. And I just kind of trusted the process, as Tamara would say. And I really did. I just let it you know, just absorb each course as it goes along and it will come out. And um, I was so happy with my, um, so I did um, assessing the quality of reconciliation in higher education administration. So can we um, put some kind of metrics onto the indigenization and reconciliation initiatives that are going on in higher ed? Um, so that was my lit review, and I and I ended up um, taking up the, the information to do a poster presentation, and I did it at a conference in October. So um, at a national um, diversity conference. So um, I did it. So that would be my highlight. That is wonderful. And Ian, so incidentally, Maria. I heard from several sources about your participation in that conference. So people are noticing the work that you do. And in terms of what you have to contribute as an individual, everyone has something to contribute because every person's experience in the higher education se sector is different. So we all have something to contribute on this landscape. Thank you so much. Uh, Greg. Yeah. And Maria's being modest. Uh, she was such a, a leader and an inspiration in our in our cohort, and uh, uh, just appreciated her as uh, in our in our in our classes. For me, the the biggest highlight was the engaging in the learning, uh, whether it be synchronous, asynchronous. But for me, the synchronous classes, uh, you know, as much as they were scheduled and timed, and you had to work around your schedule, and for many, even. Uh, international student schedules with various time zones and such uh, for group work, uh, for example. But for me, I, I really appreciated that time and that learning and hearing from so many diverse perspectives around post-secondary leadership and, and, and administration. And uh, I just learned so much. And, and I know that our cohort had a unique um, experience in terms of, you know, enduring the, the program uh, throughout the majority of the pandemic. But it was a, it was such a motivation for me uh, uh, among all the the uh, the challenges that we all experienced during the pandemic between work and and other commitments at home and uh, you know I, I'm in Ontario and so often our our synchronous classes would 
you know, be anywhere between, uh, you know, 7.30 and 9.30 p.m. for me. And, and you know, often when, you know, we'd be putting our kids to bed and I'd be excited to, to log on and to uh, hear from just so many wonderful faculty and knowledgeable faculty in the program. And then when we get in discussions, just, uh, uh, just amazing experience. I'd always come out of those those classes just feeling uh, just uh, just so inspired uh, by by the learning and the work. Thanks, Greg. I will move along to Jazdeep. Thanks. Yeah, I think um, overall the sense of camaraderie. Um, and not feeling like I was alone in the program was a big highlight for me. Um, I went through some really hard times through the pandemic. Uh, you know, obviously researching anti-racism, it wasn't the most um, uplifting topic. And I put a lot of pressure on myself, kind of got in my own way um, sometimes. And so... Um, it was quite something to rely on my cohort. Uh, we really, I don't know if it was just our cohort or if this is like a theme in Mahil, but um, Tori can also attest, like we became very close. Like we were very much invested in each other's wins and supported each other through what felt like our losses. Um, and there were pitfalls, there were tears, there, there, were, there was just encouragement. Um, but we all really pushed ourselves and got through, I feel like I got through, um, got from the program as much as I put into it. So, um, like one of the examples I have is, um, I, we, we had a professor that taught two classes and we had, um, a class in between. And so when we finished the, the third class there, um the professor and I really connected and and the feedback that she had on my paper was that there was just such a monumental difference in my writing um just between that one class uh in the middle there and um we we both teared up about it <laughs> it was quite a monumental moment um just I think for her to see the level of growth and learning that I'd gone through. And then also for me to just feel that um, level of support from a professor. So um, yeah, just overall, whether it was the teachers or or the cohort uh, folks that were in the program with me, it was just, I never really felt like I was alone in the program, even though it's not like everyone lived in the same city and kind of got through it together. You know what I mean? Um, so despite the fact that we were all across the country, uh, we were still very well connected. So that was a huge part for me. Thanks. Thank you. And I think uh, Maria and Jeff could probably attest to the strength of those cohort connections as well. One of the uh, strengths I think of the McHeel program is that it is both a blended delivery. So it's kind of bookended by face-to-face -face experiences, but the majority of the program is delivered virtually. And, and despite that, the closeness of the connections within each cohort, each cohort, pardon me, um, really carry people through with lifelong relationships that they carry through their career and continue to build that network across higher education, across the country and beyond. So it's it's really quite amazing how that happens with the Mayhill program. Yeah, I mean, some of us had kids like we were we were a wide range of folks in age and experience and background and the rest of it. But it somehow this program really brought us together. So, um, yeah, definitely true about the lifelong friendships. Um, these are relationships that I will carry with me for the rest of my life for sure. Thanks, Jesse. And Tori. Yeah, I've been I've been have the privilege of getting to sit here and, and come up with the perfect answer. And um, what comes to mind, a couple of things from our cohort. Um, 25 of us started, 24 of us finished. And, and I'm really proud of that because 
one person stepped aside out of choice, but everyone who wanted to stay made it. And, and we were all there for each other. And I mean, for me, um, when I came to residency for the first uh, summer there, I, I was on my honeymoon. I was literally getting dropped off at the gate on my honeymoon, like go to university, uh, figure it out. So now I'm, you know, it's it's thrown in with all these strangers and and that's where I met Jazz. We were in that, that first cohort during residency. And so for those uh, two weeks that you're on campus, like you're in class all day. And then in the evening, you're working on your group project. And so I remember this was the first Saturday. So we've been together since Monday morning. It's now Saturday night. There's uh, the team, we're sitting in the room in the building and it's about nine o'clock at night. And one of our classmates says, well, I need to get home. My, my husband and my kids are waiting for me. And she packs up her bag and she says, well, good night, everyone. Love you. And she walks out. And everyone still kind of got their head down on their laptops. And I stopped and I said, everyone, did you hear that? They're like, what? What? I said, she said she loves us. Oh, yes. I said, isn't that wonderful? Like we've already in one week, we've already got that that bond um, that's carried us through. And yeah, I mean, people um, one of our classmates had a baby during the program and stayed with us and graduated. One of our classmates lost her husband. Other classmates moved, changed jobs. You know, we were all there for each other through those ups and downs. So to me, the relationships um, were huge because at er any given moment, like during residency, I was in tears in the classroom because I didn't know what I was doing and I cared so much that I didn't want to feel left behind. So, you know, people were all there for each other when we need to pick me up or an 11 o'clock at night talk like Jazz did for me to help me format my first paper uh, when I'm in a cabin near, near Nanaimo on my honeymoon. So I, I give a lot of credit to Jazz for pulling me through those first few weeks. <laughs> Um, for me, what I wanted to do was, what can I do with this program? I have this freedom, like uh, Maria mentioned, to, to choose a topic. And so um, I was really fearful of research and very unsure of, of that process. And then I read a book by Sean Wilson called Research is Ceremony. And in that book, he's talking about how you can use your platform to uh, celebrate and honor your, your ancestors and, and the teachings that you've been given. And so I looked at it now as this opportunity to raise my community, to share about my people. And, and that's what I got to do. I, I wrote my final paper on, um, on leadership and two I'd seen. And um, I sat on it for over a year because I, I, I did so much work, but I just, I couldn't go back to it yet. But after a year, I said, I really need to honor this and I need to submit it because I, I don't want to feel like I didn't close the loop on my experience with my heel. So I went back and I submitted it. And back in December, I got it published. And I'm really happy for that because that to me was the culmination of what the experience was meant to be a chance for you to take the gifts that you've been given and to leave something for others now, the reciprocity that we've been taught. Uh, so for me, that's what I take away from the program. There's a chance to learn about myself and my culture and to bring that to others as well. Thank you so much, Tori. Um, your, your story about honeymooning during the <laughs> residency is truly something else. And I, I just like to take a moment and pick up on something that I've heard across several people and that's a, this idea of imposter syndrome. Um, I recently had a quite an in-depth conversation with a bunch of graduate students at Royal Roads about the idea of imposter syndrome. And it's actually quite a well-researched psychological phenomenon. And, um, and research shows that over 75% of adults experience imposter syndrome at some point in their careers or their lifetimes, and many of us more than once. Um, but the thing with Mahil is that you don't, you don't come to Mahil by accident, right? It's not, this is typically the people who make the intentional choice to join the Mahil program have something 
unique and valuable to contribute. And, um, and in addition to that, part of our uh, driving force in the program, I don't know how to put it any other way, is a desire to support student success in this, in this process. And student success looks different for everybody. So it's a, it's a process of kind of deep introspection and self-learning combined with the scholarly work around theory and processes and policy and higher education. And that really merges throughout experiences in the program. Um, and I've heard you all talk about that in some kind of way. So thank you for those stories. And the third question I have today is, how has completing the McHale program impacted you personally and professionally? I'm going to start with Tori this time. Okay, thank you, Robin. So, yeah, I, I alluded to um, how I was able to submit my paper. So, for me, that was a bit more of an independent journey. You know, we were encouraged to find a, a journal and to... Uh, learn the process and to submit it so that's uh, that was something I was able to do and I'm but I just needed the time to come back to it after finishing um, you know our program during the pandemic so we got to start in residency in person and then by the following spring as you know the pandemic started fortunately our you know the program Mahil program is pandemic proof because it is asynchronous and online and so I don't think anything really changed too drastically other than our two instructors for that course when it started, Roberta and Kyla saying, look, stuff's going on. If you need more time, talk to us. No problem. We're happy to accommodate and facilitate this. And that really gave us that, that extra lift. And I remember, um, you know, we have a, we have a group chat, uh, WhatsApp chat. And, and we were, you know, reflecting, you know, we're a couple classes in and now a pandemic started. And I made a comment like, you know, hey, everyone, we're battle tested now. We've been at this for a year, so we shouldn't be feeling the imposter syndromes and the uncertainties anymore. We should feel a sense of place now. We, we know what to expect. But then again, that was right on the doorstep of, of doing the final component, which is your uh, systematic literature review. Um, which is more a little bit more of an independent process. And that's really when you are drawing on those relationships you form to carry you through those last six months. Um, for me, I would say probably the most impactful class I took was the systems thinking, the 550 class, which is uh, the first class after residency, because uh, former students said, hey, this is a really special class. Can we have it earlier in the program? That's why 550 comes before the 530, 540 in that sequence. Um, so for me, I've, I've come to learn a little bit more about systems thinking and, and how it combines with Indigenous knowledge and specifically Ojibwe values. So that's what my paper was about. I've had the good fortune of uh, working with one of our teachers, Dr. Doug Hamilton. I got to co-teach with him the 550 class the following year in 2021. Um, uh, and then um, since then, I'm, I'm working on my application to apply to come back to Royal Roads. I'd love to do a doctor of social sciences and continue my work in indigenization and reconciliation. Um, so to me, that's that's my ultimate validation. I loved it so much. I, I'm coming back. I want to come back to campus. I want to be there with the Peacocks. I want to uh, see Jazz again, Tasha and Eden that work there on campus. Um, and I want um, this next time I want all my kids to be with me. My youngest son was with me at grad in June. Uh, we were in the brand new renovated auditorium that you you know we get to convocate in. And my wife told me that as I was crossing the stage, he was bouncing in his chair. And I want all my kids to see that next time because I have seven of them. Um, so that's my goal for the next time is to bring the whole family and celebrate together. So that's uh, what Mahil has done for me and, and all the wonderful people I've, I've come to know through it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tori. Uh... I recall when my, I graduated from my PhD program, my son was about six. 
And I remember him asking at the ceremony, he said, mama, do we have to call you Dr. Mama now? <laughs> so yes, it, it really is special to have family really integrated in that process. Maria. I was going to say, Tori, you're going to have to start like outsourcing for extra tickets now if you need like eight or for all your seven kids. <laughs> for graduation, you get like two guest tickets. Um, okay, so the completion of the Mahil program. Um, so I, what was interesting is that I, I did change jobs in the, in the midst of the Mahil program and the job I currently have was basically the job I wanted to find and get when I was done my master's and I was only six months into the, to the Mahil program. So, but I applied anyways and and I think probably because I was in progress, right? That it would be, um, uh, so it was interesting that halfway through when, when times would get tough, I'd be like, do I really need to keep going? Like I had a lot of struggles going on. I already got the job I wanted to get this degree for. So now like why, but they probably hired me because I'm in progress. So I better keep going. Um, so, I do have the job that I think um, that I will have for a while, not saying that it's the it's the pinnacle or the end, but I think for me, um, I am not going to go to get my PhD anytime soon. <laughs> um, because personally, it was a lot of time for the Mahil and I had a lot of challenges during the program so I am just grateful for a break from the academic uh, time that it consumed we had well even in our cohort right like we we had births deaths um, marriages new babies, divorces, new jobs, um, everything, you name it, you know, and, and the added stress of not knowing what the pandemic in those first couple of months, you know, and so we didn't get to meet people in person. We didn't get to build. And I remember being really kind of shy with still like Zoom and developing relationships with people it was still fairly new in, in like mid 2020. Right, like we were still thinking this is um, not going to last for very long. <clears throat> um, now this is just normal for us. But um, I, I think Greg maybe partly reason why we look so forward so much to our classes and even having you know like um, coffee and wine nights was because we nobody was leaving the house anywhere wherever we were in the world and um they even I said I have to go get something because it's like my turn to go grocery shopping and I took the class along and they really wanted to see what Winnipeg grocery stores look like and so I had them um videoing my grocery cart for 45 minutes while they were all chatting and I had them in my ears um so we did all kinds of fun things and it was really like we grew close in the in the same way and um nobody else understands except your cohort of those those things that you go through so professionally though as well um every course that i've taken has added some level of understanding background um knowledge so that I can talk about bicameral governance systems like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so the history course is, is something good to pay attention to. Thank you, Maria. And just, just to acknowledge what Maria said is that life carries on while you're working on a master's program or a graduate program. And one of the things I think Mahil does really well is to support people with their life going on while simultaneously working on an academic program of study. And we try to be as 
flexible and human and humane as possible in that process to do what we can to enable people to be uh, successful. And now I've forgotten who I started. Uh, Greg, we haven't heard from you yet. Um, that, that's so well said, flexible and humane. I can remember a couple different times having to reach out to my faculty just with life happening and, and without hesitation and within such a quick response of support and, and flexibility, whether it be needing a bit more time on an assignment or wh whatever it was, just I, uh, that's, uh, that's so important that I feel like Royal Roads really, um, is, it's just not lip service, it's real. And there's so many examples of that, I think, throughout, throughout uh, the program in our cohort. Uh, in terms of personally and professionally, I'll, I'll start professionally in terms of the impact. Um, it, it's, it's made an incredible impact from just the applicability of the learning in my day-to-day -day work. I'm in mid-management at the college that I, that I work with and, and all the courses in some way, shape or form come into play uh, in my day-to-day -day work. Uh, and uh, and just so appreciative of that and, ref and reflecting on on, on so much of the learning that's applicable in my day-to-day -day work. Uh, from, a, from a growth standpoint, I was offered an opportunity to uh, transition from a manager to a director position um, shortly after completion of the program. And, you know, my supervisor directly said that, you know, to, to be at the director level at our institution, it, that, you know, the master's was, was something to be, to be expected. And so to have that credential behind me in order to be able to uh, be afforded that opportunity at my institution is is uh, is an example of uh, of uh, completing the program, uh, and then just the flexibility moving forward. I mean, the, the back half of my career and and to to have the master's credential through McGill, whether it be uh, you know when my kids get a bit older, if I wanted to make the leap to senior management, um, or whether I wanted to move into teaching or you know, shift into a different area of leadership or, or working in post-secondary, this, this Mahil program and this credential is, is going to give me that, that flexibility, um, you know, as I move forward towards the, the last part of my career. Uh, in terms of personally, uh, to be able to uh, celebrate uh, the completion of the program with my family, with my partner, my wife, and my two kids uh, at Royal Worlds, uh, it's just a memory that uh, that I'll remember for the rest of my lifetime. Uh, when I crossed the stage, my kids uh, were quite loud in the Dogwood Auditorium in terms of their cheering uh, for me to where when I uh, shook uh, uh, President Steen Camp's hand, he, he joked about me having quite the cheering section, which again is a memory that, that I'll have uh, for the rest of my life and a, a moment for our, our family. And uh, uh, one last anecdote that I'll say, uh, I recall when I got my first uh, assignment uh, and I got an A minus was, was the grade and, and then knowing what it, it sort of took to, to reach that and then knowing also what it would take to get an A or an A plus and sort of assessing the, the commitment that I needed to have. But in not thinking of it from a personal perspective, one thing that I kept in mind when doing this program is I wasn't going to let uh, the program have a significant impact on the time with my family and my kids. And so Often it would be when my kids went to bed, 9 p.m. till midnight or 1 a.m. or you know the odd time having to take a break too, is that uh, you know that I that A minus reminded me that you know it was okay to be an A minus student if it, if I was still going to be an A plus dad and 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 support from my family and uh, that's something that carried with me throughout the program and in completion of the program from a personal perspective that that I'm proud of that I was able to complete that but still be able to balance uh, the importance of the time with my family and my, uh, my kids, especially. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. And Jazdeep. Yeah, I'd say both personally and professionally, um, the program gave me the confidence to feel like I belong in the spaces that I occupy. And well, so the master's meant I outgrew the position that I held during the program. So I moved positions when I completed. I went on to become a project coordinator. 
Uh, and now I hold a community relations position at UVic where I oversee a group of students leading peer workshops related to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and that's been, that's in alignment with, with my master's. So um, I think I credit that to, to um, where I am now. But as a project coordinator, I was given um, a project related to doing an equity, diversity, and inclusion climate scan for the entirety of a student affairs division. Um, but ultimately, it wasn't a good fit because the vision and the experience and the evidence-based decisions that I was trying to make based off of my master's weren't necessarily in alignment with what the university was looking for. And that was a real challenge for me. Um, but I knew that my master's had taught me to honor my experience, um, to, to have the confidence to occupy the spaces that I'm in, and to make that evidence-based decision um, making to whatever role I'm in. So, you know, despite that not working out the way that I thought it would, I've moved on to something better. And it's in alignment with who I am as a human being um, and what I stand for and the, the honoring of my experience um, was just something that I, that I think was linked to the initial fears that I had of not doing anti-racism as my master's topic in the first place. So to have that 180 shift as a result of this program, that's something that's just completely priceless. Um, so I, I definitely accredit the program to that. And, and obviously I, I put, I, I, I got out of the program as much as I put into it. So, um, the imposter syndrome, overcoming that, um, and really coming into my own in this line of work, I think, um, is one of the biggest impacts that this program has had for me, for sure. Thank you so much, Jess, Dave. I would like to leave a little time in case people have questions. So Ariana, I think I'm going to pass it along to you to say a little bit more about the program. Absolutely, thank you so much. That was a, a really beautiful discussion. I just wanna um, acknowledge that. So thank you to everybody for sharing your experience. That was that was really moving um, for me to, to listen to. So I really appreciate you all being here. Um, with that being said, those really powerful things. Um, we'd just like to tell you a little bit about uh, how to apply in case uh, folks in the room or watching the recording are thinking about applying to the Mahil program. There are a couple steps here, um, just very briefly. Of course, there's more information on our website, but to apply online, um, you start by paying an um, online application fee. It's $131.39. Um, and then we just have some supporting documents. So things like transcripts, a personal statement, which is really just your intention coming into the program, um, what you wanna get out of it and why you think it's a good fit for you at this time. Um, a structured resume as well, um, to get really detailed in um, talking about your work experience, volunteer experience, and everything that you've done, just so we can get a whole picture of who you are um, and who you are coming into the, the program. And two letters of reference as well. Um, I know one personal and one professional is preferred, but it can also be um, professional or uh, work-related as well. And just a little bit about the admission requirements. There's a lot of text here on the screen, um, but we have at Royal Roads standard admissions and flexible admissions. So for standard admissions, uh, we're looking for a four-year or comparable um, undergraduate degree from a recognized post-secondary institution, um, and then a minimum of three years of relevant paid work experience within um, higher education institutions, um, just to kind of summarize it briefly. But of course, um, there's more details here on the slide um, and on our website under the application 
requirements um, on the Mahil program page. Um, and there's also flexible admissions as well, which um, is one of my favorite parts, um, speaking about Royal Roads University. So to be considered, of course, for flexible admissions, um, we normally require a minimum of seven years work experience um, in higher education institutions um, for the Mahil program. So again, it gives you a little list. Um, leadership experience, again, it <laughs> defines it a bit more on the slide. Um, it can um, include one or more of the following. Um, again, all of these details are online, so we encourage um, folks to just have a look through. Um, but of course, get those applications in because um, it is up to admissions to um, assess accordingly. As far as key dates go, um, for the Master of Arts in Higher Education Administration and Leadership, the start date is June 12th, 2023, um, and the application deadline, it's coming up soon, I can hardly believe it, March 12th, 2023, it does not feel like February to me, so that's why I say that, um, but we do have assess applications on a rolling basis, so again, if you're thinking about applying, you can submit your application today um, and get those papers in and, and documents in now, um, rather than waiting to the deadline. It's always a, a good practice to do. Um, as far as services available to you, of course, we realize at Royal Roads, going back to school is a very big step. So we have financial resources that are available to you um, through financial aid and awards. So things like loans, bursaries, scholarships, other awards, um, student research scholarships, and emergency funding as well. Um, they can be reached um, at the URL on the screen, so royalroads.ca slash admission slash financial aid awards, um, or just by typing that into a search engine. Um, we also have enrollment services. Um, Lisa's on the line. Enrollment services is wonderful. Of course, I'm biased in saying that, um, but they are really great. They can be reached at Rural Roads, uh, sorry, learn.more at ruralroads.ca. Forgot what I was saying there for a second. I got distracted um, by how wonderful enrollment is. And there's some phone numbers on the screen for uh, local and toll free in North America. Um, they're really wonderful at uh, narrowing down your program options. They can connect you uh, with wonderful alumni like these folks on the line um, and then answer any questions that you have about your application. So if you're stuck along the process, please reach out to them. They are great. And thank you. Um, feel free, of course, to contact us um, by that email if you have um, any questions and to keep up to date with the Mahil program. Um, with that, if we do have any questions, I will check the chat now. Let me just stop sharing my screen. Yes, if you have questions, I invite you to ask questions in the chat and we can turn them over to our panel. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Robin. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat as of yet, but of course it takes a couple minutes generally to um, type those out if anybody has anything. Um, do you have any kind of final words to um, cap us off here? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm also biased, but I think this program's pretty great. I think you should do it. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> uh, no, just to say that I have spent my entire career in higher education, and Mikhail is really unique. It, ha it is um, certainly a gem on the higher education landscape and has a lot to offer folks who are intending to make higher education leadership their long-term career path. So um, just want to say as well, I will, I'll leave my email information in the chat and people are welcome to contact me anytime. I'm happy to have a phone conversation or a Zoom conversation to uh, kind of flesh out whether or not you think you're a good fit for the Mahil program at this point, or to answer any questions if you have them. So my, um, my virtual door is always open and I see Jazdeep has included her email address here as well. Oh, oh thanks, Lisa. I didn't even have to type it in. That's awesome. And there, my email is in the chat as well. So you are, are welcome to be in touch anytime. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Robin. Thank you again to all of our wonderful panelists. Again, we so appreciate you being here. Your stories and experiences um, really moved me. And I know they will move everybody who watches the recording and everybody who's on the line today. So again, thank you so much. Um, our emails are in the chat. I will post them in the um, follow-up emails as well. So folks who are tuning into um, the recording uh, can reach out as well. So yeah, thank you for considering the Mahil program. Um, and we will see you in a webinar very soon. Take care, everybody.
Bye. Yana.